Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, we're going to show some big time love to the rhythm section. We got one of the greatest drummers in rock and roll over the last 30 years with us today with Mike Portnoy. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. First, I want to thank Ray Luzier for yeah. hooking us up. Thank you, Ray. You're the man. And also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe and subscribe to the audio and the YouTube channel. All right, quick background on Mike. One of the founding members of Dream Theater, a band he played with for 25 years. That's 17 albums, dozens of official bootlegs through 2010. He's currently the drummer in Sons of Apollo with Ron Thal, who's on this show. And they've got three LPs, Winery Dogs, of course, guitar players Richie Kotzen, and they have four records. Transatlantic with Neil Morse, nine albums. Flying Colors with Steve Morse, who was on this show, five records. The Neil Morse Band and Metal Allegiance, sorry, with Alex Skolnick and Andreas Kisser. Both of those guys are on here. He's also recorded and or toured and performed live with Avenged Sevenfold, Neil Morse with over 20 records, Twisted Sister, Adrenaline Mob, PSMS, Liquid Tension Experiment, OSI, Big Elf, Hail, Stone Sour, Fate's Warning, Overkill, G3, and Four, tri four tribute bands with Paul Gilbert, who is also on here. Yellow Matter Custard, Hammer of the Gods, Amazing Journey, and Cygnus and the Sea Monsters. Mike's originally from Long Beach, Long Island. Uh, Malibu? Is that, is that yeah. where? I'm, yeah, I went to there like 100 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. He grew up learning to play the drums, primarily self-taught by listening to his early biggest influences, which are Ringo Starr, Keith Moon, and John Bonham. As he developed a taste for more challenging, progressive music, he became more turned on by Neil Peart and Frank Zappa. He attended Berklee College of Music on a scholarship in 85, which is where he formed the Dream Theater. With, again, he sustained a successful career for 25 years with them, and they developed a huge fan base with record sales, over 10 million copies worldwide. Mike also co-produced a lot of the Dream Theater records. His long list of awards includes 30 Modern Drummer Magazine Reader's Poll Awards, including Hall of Fame, MVP of the Year twice, Best Progressive Rock Drummer, a record of 13 times, <laughs> Best Clinician twice, Best Educational Video and DVD for Liquid Drum Theater, and Best Recorded Performance of the Year eight times. He also holds the distinction of being the youngest drummer in Modern Drummers Hall of Fame. Well, also, not anymore. That changed. Dave Grohl just got in. Oh, my God. <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, I've been dethroned by Dave Grohl, but, man, uh, anyway, don't let me, don't let me interrupt you. I, I know. This is, I'm a fucking exhausted, man. Uh, <laughs> He's also the recipient of 16 Drum Magazine Drummy Awards, including Drummer of the Year for three times, Revolver's Golden God Award in 2011 for Drummer of the Year. I've never talked to a Golden God, Mike. Thank you so much for your time, brother. Thanks for coming on the show, man. I know you're so All there. right. I guess we're out of time. Thanks, yeah. man. Thanks for having Thank you. Me. It's been great. <laughs> I mean, what um, else could you possibly want to know? You just said it all. I got everything here, man. <laughs> um, when uh, you're, How the hell did you manage to learn? You're also proficient at bass and guitar, man. How the hell did you find time to learn that? Like, well, it makes all this. I wouldn't say proficient. I mean, I could get around and I could convey ideas, but uh, I'm not really a great player. But, I, I mean, I taught myself those instruments the same way I taught myself drums, really, you know. Uh, I mean, I always wanted to always be more than just a drummer. Even when I started as a kid, I started on the piano and – even though I migrated to the drums, I was always interested in the bigger picture of music in general. And that's when, when I went off to Berkeley um, uh, for college, it was not about the drums. It was about all the other stuff, you know, music theory, harmony, sight singing, ear training, arranging. I was taking all those classes. So for me, it was never about the drums. To me, it was about music in general. So, you know, picking up a guitar and a bass was, you know, obviously a natural thing for me to do because I, you know, it was never about the drums. It just happened to be the, the, the seat I sat in, you know, and yeah. ended up uh, going down that road. Very cool, man. It's <laughs> fair that you got guys that talent, that you have someone that you're that talented to do all three, man. Um, you ever consider doing anything else besides music or was it always that's like you knew? Cause I know you got turned on to it young by your dad. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I would say I have just a bigger passion for a film as I do about music, but um, I've never, I've never done anything. I mean, I've always directed like the live DVDs, like all the Dream Theater live DVDs. I always di like directed and oversaw those, and even the the uh, DVDs I've put out. 
you know, with uh, Sons of Apollo or, or, you know, any of the other bands I'm a part of now, I've always overseen the, 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 the uh, you know, the concert portion, you know, performance videos and stuff like that, live videos. But, uh, but anyway, to answer your question, my biggest love uh, beyond music is film. I mean, filmmakers and directors, people like Stanley Kubrick and David Lynch and Quentin Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson, the Coen brothers. I mean, those guys are as big of a, artistic inspiration on me as my musical heroes. And, and I, I spend probably just as much time watching, you know, films and, you know, well-made TV these days uh, as I do listening to music. Cool. Never wanted to be like an accountant or anything like that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I can't do anything, anything other than drumming. You ask my wife, if I have to change the light bulb in the house, it's a, it's a four hour process. Yeah, thank God I know how to play drums because I definitely can't do anything else. <laughs> Uh, man, I want to say one thing about when you left Dream Theater, I really give you a lot of credit for doing that because, you know, ending a 25 year relationship, whether it's professional or personal is not, you know, a romantic relationship. It's not an easy thing to do. Oh yeah. And I, I was and I'm, honestly, man, that took a lot of balls. Um, I was curious if you're comfortable answering, what did you learn? Two questions. How long did it take for you not being in dream theater for that to be your new norm? And what did you learn from that experience of leaving like for, as a uh, personal growth thing for you? It's funny that you said I have balls because <laughs> I had a lot of friends that when I did that, like, you know, that, you know, that was their response. I remember talking to Scott Ian from Anthrax like yeah. the day after whatever. And that was exactly what he said. He's like, man, that takes balls. I admire your balls, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. Um, 25 years, it was my baby from from formation to all the way, you know, the the, yeah. the level that the band was at at that point 25 years later. And uh, that was a lot of perseverance to get there. Uh, so to walk away from it was one of the hardest things I, I'll ever have to do, really. But um, it was uh, it's something I had to do because after 25 years and – during that time, I was always the most hands-on guy in the band. I think since then, they've gone on to delegate things and share things. But uh, it's easy to forget at this point that, you know, at that stage, I was the one that was overseeing the merchandise and the fan clubs and the websites and the music and the lyrics and the melodies and the production and all that stuff. And, and uh, it, was, it was exhausting. And um, I just needed a break. I was burnt. I was burnt out on, you know... All of that. You know, anyway, I don't want to get into the whole breakup and the split, but what? No, no. It was something I had to do or else I would have been uh, regretful. People ask, do you have any regrets about that? I think uh, I love the quote that it's better to regret something you have done than something you haven't done. And uh -huh. I think that's where I was at. I was at a point where, like, if I had stayed, I probably would have been resentful for all the things that I was not able to do and to, because I, I was starting to feel trapped and they wanted me to commit to a, a certain date to start the next record and I just wasn't ready and it, it, it became a you know a Mexican standoff really um, and I, I I went with my my heart and said look I'd rather regret something I have done than something I haven't and I'm not saying I do regret it because I don't because look sure. at what I've done since then I mean I look at the last decade um, since I left I've made like 40 albums with dozens of different bands. I mean, look at the, the list that you listed <laughs> at the top of the show. I would say 80% <laughs> of those things records. that you listed yeah. are post dream theater things that I've been able to do and people have been able to play with. So uh, I can't remember what your specific question on this topic was, but I mean, I, um, it was, it was, when did that become the, no how long did it take for that? to become the norm for you? Like, uh, and what did you get out of that experience? Like, well, what it, personal, oh, that's right, right, right. Yeah. Well, what did I get out of it was uh, all this amazing musical opportunities I've had since then. You know, being able to be in a band with Billy Sheen and Richie Koch and being in another band with Steve Morris and doing another band with Alex Skolnick and David Ellison and, and on and on and on. I could list all the people I've played with. You, you already did. So <laughs> yeah, those, those, that's, those are opportunities I've been able to, pursue and wouldn't have if I had uh, not followed my heart. Uh, what have I learned? I, I learned that the internet is a very scary thing <laughs> day because that first year after the split, um, 
you know, I just couldn't say anything without it becoming like these giant clickbait headlines on these uh, websites. You know, no matter what I said, no matter how tastefully or gracefully I tried to say it, it always got twisted and, and misinterpreted and uh, turned into just some sort of, uh, you know, catchphrase clickbait headline. So I learned, um, I learned, you know, in, especially in that first year after I left that I had to just really be careful what I said or don't say anything at all, you know, then yeah. I had to start to tread carefully because we live in this age now where it's everything is in real time and people, the internet trolls just love to bury you. They love to run with whatever they can. See, when I was growing up, if somebody left the band, when Peter Chris left Kiss, you know, um, you had to wait a month to read about it in Circus Magazine. Circus, yeah. Man. Yeah, or get, you know, you get you join the fan clubs to get the newsletters to get the information on these bands. You know, when I was a kid, you had to really wait to find out the news and find out the, the, the dirt. Uh, nowadays, we live in a time where it's it's in everything is in real time. When yeah. I left Dream Theater, it was like, you know, I made a post on my website uh, just explaining what was happening. And then five minutes later, it just exploded. And people were acting as if I put out some sort of press release. It wasn't a press release. It was my feelings and, you know, my explanation of what, of what happened. So I learned through that whole process, you got to be very, very careful what you say, how you say it, uh, or if you should even say something at all or not say anything at all. And these days, I try not to even talk about Dream Theater at all. I could already see what we're talking about here is going to become a headline. And people are going to be like, why is he lingering on Dream Theater? Well, I do. No, I asked you the called. question. I don't. Well, I hope nobody okay. says it. put it on me, a hundred percent. And I really well, didn't ask you about Dream Theater. But, I asked you about. Well, the the point is that uh, people don't they they don't realize when they see this quote on Blabbermouth that it's coming from a thing called an interview. Yeah. <laughs> and what these things do is a journalist will ask the artist a question, and I like to answer the question as honestly as I can, or don't answer it at all if I choose not to, but. You know, I'm not lingering on these things. I'm answering a question. You know, you're asking about my career, my life, and the split. And that's what we do. You know, we do interviews. If you, if you can't be honest or can't handle it, then you shouldn't do interviews. But in my right. case, I like to be open and honest with, with the listeners and the, and the fans. And in any case, there you go. Thank you, man. Thank you. I was just, you know, I thought from a self-care standpoint, that takes a lot of, you know, a lot of guts to do. Well, it did. And it wasn't, it wasn't an easy decision. I, I had to spend a lot of time with my wife talking about it and, and uh, you know, but once again, no regrets, it, it, you know, everything happens for a reason and I'm happy and they, they're happy and let's move on to other things. <laughs> let's Tell move me, on to uh, things I'm doing now. Yeah, man, I'm talking about that right now. So yeah. talk about uh, for each of these uh, bands that you're in now. Tell me about how that how you wound up connecting with them, and maybe a cooler, interesting story about your experience working together. Let's start with Sons, Sons of Apollo. Well, Sons of Apollo um, uh, started um, right after I left Dream Theater. I reconnected with Derek Sherinian, who was always a a good friend of mine and a musician I always really admired. Uh, he was in he was in Dream Theater in the '90s, and uh, after I left. We reconnected and wanted to do something together. So we put together an all instrumental live fun thing called PSMS. Well, it wasn't really called that. It was just our names, Portnoy, Sheehan, uh, McAlpine, and Chirinian. So it was me, Derek, Billy Sheehan, and Tony McAlpine. It was just a fun little instrumental live thing that, that uh, we put together just to get out there and play music from all of our careers and, and have fun. And that was it. So we, um, we did you know some touring with that, and that was the end of that. And then we all went off to our other ways. Years later, Derek kept um, trying to egg me on to like, hey, man, let's put together like a real band. Let's get a singer and turn it into a real band. And at the time, I just had too many other things going on. I was too busy with, uh, I think at the time I had, uh, I don't know, Winery Dogs and Neil Morse Band and Flying Colors and all these other things. But there came a, a point in like 2017 where I think my time with Twisted Sister was coming to an end. And Winery Dogs was taking a break. So uh, I said to Derek, all right, let's do this. Let's, let's put this together. So we, uh, we brought on board uh, Ron Thal, Bumblefoot. And we brought on board Jeff Scott Soto. And that's how the Sons of Apollo was born. We put out our first album in 2017. We went on tour throughout 2018. And now uh, next month, January 17th, we have our, our uh, second album coming out. And then uh, we'll be hitting the road touring with that pretty much through uh, – 
you know, the first half of 2020. Where, where are the tours? Where are you going to be touring? Uh, we start in North America. January and February is through uh, America and a couple of Canadian dates. Then um, um, February and March, we're in Europe. April, we're in South America. And uh, that's what's on the books so far. We'll see where we go from there. Awesome, man. And people can go to, I'm assuming, sonsofapollo.com and get all the info on that? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right, talk about winery dogs. How'd, those, how'd you get, how'd come together with those guys and cooler? And Win, winery there? dogs is myself, Billy Sheehan, and Richie Kotzen. Um, the same way that Sons of Apollo stemmed from PSMS and turned into something entirely different, the same thing kind of happened with winery dogs. Winery dogs stemmed from a project I was initially doing with John Sykes. Um, and John asked me to work, uh, work on some material he was working on. So he and I did like 12 demos. To, uh, we did it like 12 songs together. We demoed them. And, uh, and at that point, I brought Billy Sheehan on board. Uh, so the idea was to do this power trio with me, John Sykes, and Billy Sheehan. Long story short, um, John just kept kind of waiting and waiting and waiting. And it was hard to get him motivated and hard to get him to move forward. So Billy and I just got frustrated and kind of just jumped ship and decided to do something else entirely. So that's when uh, our mutual friend Eddie Trunk suggested Richie Kotzen, and um, that's when the Winery Dogs was born. So I, I wouldn't say the Winery Dogs was born out of the thing with John Sykes. That was kind of where it began. And, but, and once Richie came on board, we started from scratch with a fresh slate. And that's, you know, we started from there and wrote everything with, you know, Richie, myself, and Billy. And that's how the Winery Dogs was born. We did two uh, two studio albums, a lot of touring, uh, and then went on a bit of a hiatus a few years ago for Billy and I to do Sons and for Richie to do his solo stuff. And this past summer, we got together and did a U.S. tour just for the fun of it. And it was it was really a blast and reminded how, reminded us how much we love each other and reminded us how much the fans love the band. So. Uh, we're kind of like reignited and excited to get together to uh, work on a third album at some point soon. So uh, hopefully that in the cards maybe uh, sometime next year. Awesome. It's a great band. I love, I love listening to you guys. Uh, Flying Colors. Flying Colors was one of the first things that I worked on after Dream Theater. Um, it was towards the beginning of 2011 that um, um, we, we, we put this together. There was a, a guy named Bill Evans, who was a mutual friend of all of us in the band uh, that wanted, he had this vision of putting together, uh, you know, uh, Steve Morse and Neil Morse. It started with those two. And then, uh, you know, I ended up coming on board and Dave LaRue came on board. Um, so the idea was to do this kind of, you know, prog musicians or instrumental musicians, but doing more kind of pop oriented, straight ahead rock music. Um, so, you know, the, the, the uh, personnel surely intrigued me. I always wanted to work with Steve Morse. Steve's always been one of my biggest guitar heroes. Um, and then, you know, uh, the Dixie Dregs had gone out opening for Dream Theater and Dream Theater had gone out opening for Deep Purple. So, you know, there was a history there. So it was the idea of uh, actually being in a band together and making music together uh, surely appealed to me. So in any case, 2001, we got together and you know, we kind of had uh, Neil and I as an existing uh, pair and Steve and Dave as an existing right. pair. We came together and then I was the one that suggested Casey McPherson as a singer because I was a fan of Casey's work with um, Endosheen and Alpha Reb. So I suggested him and that's how Flying Colors was born. And we've now done three studio albums. I just got home yesterday from our European tour. We were uh, doing some select shows in support of our latest uh, album third degree so um yeah we filmed uh filmed the show a couple nights ago in london for an upcoming live dvd which will come out next year and what a band i mean uh, what a great group of musicians and personalities such distinctive musical styles in this melting pot too you know like neil is a prog guy casey's more of like an alternative guy from the world of like muse and radiohead and coldplay and then you got Steve, who's, you know, the ultimate guitar hero with that country twang. And Dave's Mr. Funk. You know, he's funky and jazzy. And then I'm kind of like, you know, the prog metal guy. So, you know, you put us all into this giant melting pot, and it's such a unique blend of styles. 
Is there a number one question when Steve was on the show, the follow up question I had from listeners was when is flying colors going to come out with more stuff? And yeah. The biggest, gonna... the biggest frustration with us is that we can't work together more. And um, I don't want to pinpoint it to Steve. I'm not blaming Steve. It's just yeah, the sure. reality. The reality of the situation is, uh, you know, he's tied down with Deep Purple and he can't necessarily control Deep Purple's schedule. Like, you know, Neil and I are in a lot of different bands and do a lot of different things, but we're generally in control of our destinies. So I could say, okay, well, this is a six month window and I'm penciling it in for this band. You know, I could control my schedule. Sure. Eve does, you know, he's kind of at the mercy of Deep Purple. So it's hard to always get a commitment from him from Deep Purple, you know, six to nine months in advance. And it makes it very difficult for us to be able to function, you know, e as easily as it is in other bands. Sure. So, you know, it's, it's taken time to get the records together with Flying Colors. It's taken t time to be able to do shows. And usually we can only do them in uh, limited places during limited times. For instance, this last Flying Colors tour was booked around Steve's days, days off from Deep Purple. So we were literally following the Purple Tour and playing on their days off. So as long as Purple is still active or as active as they are, it's kind of limiting how often Flying Colors can function. And, you know, if that changes down the road, I, we, would all, we would all love to work more with the band. We all love the band. So I guess time will tell. Thanks. And how about Neil? How did you guys get together? You well, Neil and I... Uh, Neil and I have the deepest musical relationship uh, by far uh, that I've ever had. In fact, I, I would venture to say there's probably not many duos in music history that have uh, as deep of a connection. I think he and I have now done 22 studio albums. Yeah. Together, 22 studio albums together. I don't know. That might be Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. I don't know. That's a um, lot, man. There's not many duos that I could think of that have made that many studio albums together. So, but the relationship goes back about 20 years. Um, he was the leader and the the you know the composer for Spock's Beard, and I first heard of Spock's Beard around '94 or '95. Immediately fell in love with the band. Immediately fell in love with Neil's writing and his singing and his playing, and kind of just took them under my wing, took them out on tour with Dream Theater and just really was their biggest cheerleader, always talking about them in interviews. And uh, in any case, uh, around 1999 or so, I had the itch to put together some sort of prog rock super group and I wanted to work with Neil. So I put together Transatlantic with Neil and with Pete Travis from Marillion and um, Royna Stolt from the Flower Kings. And we put together Transatlantic and that's when mine and Neil's musical collaboration began. Um, and since then, uh, we've done f uh, five, well, I guess uh, four studio albums with Transatlantic, a fifth is being worked on right now. Uh, you know, 20 years of Transatlantic, and then Neil and I went on to do Flying Colors together. And then when he left Spock's Beard and began his solo career around 2002, um, he asked me to be a part of that as well. So I've always been the drummer on all of his solo albums throughout all, you know, 2002 through about 2015. And then around 2015 or so, we took his solo band and kind of morphed it into a new collaborative band called the Neil Morse Band. So now we have that as well. And we've done three studio albums with that. And we have a live album coming out in March. So, yeah, so Neil and I, uh, we, you know, we have all these different bands together. We also did Yellow Matter Custard together, which was my Beatles tribute band. So. I just have a, a deep, deep uh, love for him and his art, you know, artistic uh, abilities. You know, it's just a lot of mutual respect between the two of us um, on a musical level, also a personal level. You know, when he left Spock's Beard, I was there for him. When I left Dream Theater, he was there for me. And we've been on this uh, incredible musical journey together now for over 20 years. That's awesome, man. Uh, this is a tough question. Top knee-jerk reaction top three musical experiences you had oh wow um well i mean there's wow that's that's hard that's a hard answer because it's been such a crazy career you know um i, I immediately think of certain concerts uh the dream theater score concert at radio city music hall which we put out as a dvd called score it was a 20th anniversary show we played with an orchestra 
that was always one of the immediate knee-jerk responses for me when I think of a specific show. Uh, also, Sons of Apollo's show uh, with an orchestra was also amazing. We put, recently put that out as a live DVD the, uh, from Plovdiv, and we did a, a lot of really cool covers at that show, everything from Pink Floyd to Led Zeppelin to Ozzy to Van Halen, Rainbow. Uh, that was a real special, special night, too. Um, maybe my 50th birthday concerts aboard Cruise to the Edge. We, uh, we had a, a, a series of concerts on, on that cruise celebrating my 50th birthday. And at them, I kind of played with all of my bands. You know, we did a, a set with Transatlantic, a set with Flying Colors. Um, I debuted uh, my, my Shattered Fortress project, which was playing uh, the Dream Theater 12 Step Suite for the first time with the guys from Haken. Uh, I did some liquid tension experiment at that uh, at those shows with with Tony Levin. So yeah, once again, it's just off the top of my head that that fiftieth fiftieth birthday concert was a uh, well concerts. That's another one that comes to mind. So that's three off the top of my head. But man, I mean, there's so many like um, you know headlining Grass Pop or Hellfest to like eighty thousand people. You know, headlining with Twisted Sister. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, doing the stuff I did with Avenged Sevenfold, you know, was amazing. Uh, playing to 100,000 people with Stone Sour at Rock and Rio. I mean, that was amazing. Uh, you know, mu being the musical director for Eddie Trunk's 30th anniversary show and getting to play with like Ace Fraley and Peter Chris, you know, amongst all these other people. Yeah, I mean, so these are just off the top of my head. These are the ones, the concerts that kind of stand out as great, great, you know, stuff the stuff of dreams for me yeah man uh you grew up long beach uh in long beach and then you i think you moved to Cal well, long beach new york not long beach california right long beach long island sorry about that right. what was what was your childhood like growing up well um <clears throat> i was born april 20th 1967 that was the day that the beatles completed sergeant pepper so there was a very certain symmetry there um, and because I became the biggest Beatles fanatic of all time. So, uh, that, you know, I was born the day they completed my favorite album of all time. So it was, you know, crazy, but I grew up surrounded by music. My dad was a rock and roll fan. He introduced me to the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and Hendrix and all that stuff. When I was literally six months old, I was surrounded by records everywhere. And that became my passion. Um, my mom and dad got divorced when I was about a year and a half old. So I, my, my mom raised me um, and I would go visit my dad. Uh, you know, he moved out to Carmel, California, became a rock and roll disc jockey. Um, but in any case, you know, my first 10 years or so were, you know, normal kind of New York, Long Island, suburban upbringing, loving music, uh, you know, around late seventies, I got my first drum set. And uh, at that time, I was a big fan of like Kiss and, uh, you know, then came the whole punk rock movement, like Sex Pistols and the Ramones. I was really into that. Then uh, then I started discovering progressive rock and that's kind of how I went in that direction. But yeah, that, that's my childhood in a nutshell. What was your first break like musically? Well, I didn't have a break until, I guess, until Dream Theater broke in 92 but at that point we had already been together seven years you know my first seven years with dream theater from 85 to 92 were spent struggling and writing we just spent all those years writing and writing and practicing and practicing and writing and waiting for our big break and so many false starts you know uh our first record deal ended up being you know horrible nothing happened uh, we ended up changing singers for two or three times so those first seven years were filled with, um, you know, um, broken dreams, you know, broken promises and failed dreams. And, and it was the perseverance of those first seven years that made us as strong as we were. And then I guess the first break was when we finally put out our second album, Images and Words, in 92. Even then, it was out for about five or six months before anything happened. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, Somehow radio picked up on it and then MTV picked up on it. And we finally had a hit with pull me under and that's when the ride began. And, you know, even after the ride began, there were lots of ups and downs that still continued to follow, but that's, that's what I would call the quote unquote first big break. First break. Um, what kept you personally, what 
kept you hanging in there, man? That's a long, that's a big commitment. That's a, like, like where'd you get your drive from? I guess is what I'm it asking. It was, it was our, uh, I think it, there's a line in the song called only a matter of time, uh, which our keyboard player, Kevin Moore wrote the lyrics to. And that song only a matter of time was about that faith, that, uh, perseverance we had. And there's a line in there that's, I think, quote unquote, fearless faith in destiny. And that summed it up. We knew, we knew we would, we would um, achieve success if we just stuck by our guns and we followed our hearts and never gave up. And I mean, that can apply to anybody. That you sure. know, that was what we took to heart, and that's how we persevered. We believed in ourselves. We believed in the music we were writing, and we believed in the musicianship in this band. And no matter how many times we got kicked and knocked down, we just. We never stayed down. We would get back up and, and continue on. And that we knew it was only a matter of time as the song goes. That's awesome, man. Thank you. That's really cool. Um, what were some of the bigger surprises for you early on about the business end of being a professional musician? Well, we learned a lot about the business in those years that I'm talking about here. I mean, those years were... You know, we learned, uh, you know, you got you to gotta remember the industry back in the 80s was very, very different. So when, yeah. when we were starting out, uh, obviously there was no internet. Uh, so basically, um, you had to have a record deal. If you wanted anything to happen, if you wanted to go anywhere, you had to have a record deal. And uh, you couldn't make a record unless you had the backing of a label to, to you know, to do that. So it was all about getting the record deal. And once you had it, it was all about making the record. Then once you made the record, it was about the marketing. You know, you couldn't go anywhere without MTV back in the eighties. Yeah. Um, so those first m many years for us, uh, even once we got that first record deal, it still never clicked, you know, and, and you, we just had to stick with it. And we learned that the music industry is, um, it's, it could be brutal. And, um, you know, uh, we had to get out of our first record deal in order to sign our deal for Images and Words. And, you know, we went through many singers, we went through many lawyers, we went through many different ups and downs and lawsuits. And we realized that the music business is indeed a business. And a lot of people back then would think that the record deal was, I mean, yes, the record deal was the ultimate um, goal that you were trying to achieve, but there was a misinterpretation where that that was, uh, the be all end all. And that was the end of the rainbow. But realistically, that was just the beginning yeah. of the struggles. You know, once you had that record deal, okay, that's when it turns into a business because everything up until then is just about the music. You're making music with friends and you just want to write music. And then once you sign that deal, once there's other people having a piece, you know, a piece of your pie, it, it never, never goes back to the way it was. It's never innocent again. It's never about the music again, unless you really, really fight for it. And usually you don't get that control back until years down the road where you can actually, uh, when you have the leverage to get it back. When we made Images and Words, we worked with a producer that just made that process, that recording session very, very difficult for all of us. It was, it was a struggle. Um, and for years we had to work with outside producers and work with labels that were having a lot of opinions on our music. And it wasn't until about, uh, 1999, almost 15 years into our career when we were making scenes from memory, where we were on the verge of breaking up and we kind of just put our foot down and said, look, if you still want to have a band, you got to back off, get out of our hair, let us do our thing. Um, and at that point, myself and John Petrucci began producing the albums and, uh, you know, I took a much more bigger role in leading the band and not like, you know, take listening to anybody else, getting the label and management and everybody out of our hair. So, but, you know, we didn't have that kind of leverage until many, many albums into our career and, and almost 15 years yeah. to, to get to that point. So we had to learn the, the ups and downs of the business and, and we, we got, we got, kicked to the curb many, many times and we'd have to brush ourselves off and get back up and try again. Thank you, man. Uh, any, any, what were some of the low points maybe or the dark periods you've had to deal with uh, any time during life and, and how'd you get through them? You mentioned well, those, uh, musically, those are the ones, you know, yeah. I just mentioned, you know, the time before images and words, the time leading up to scenes for memory, those were the toughest periods for dream theater. And then also obviously when I left the band, um, 
you know, that was, that was tough for me as well and dealing with the, the backlash with that and recovering from that. So yeah, those, in terms of my career, those were certainly the biggest moments in terms of my life. Um, you know, uh, I, I lost my mom in a, um, in a, a plane crash, a, a, you know, a unexpected plane crash um, when I was 17 years old. So something like that, you know, changes your life forever, you know, like, boom, at, at the drop of a, a dime, you know, when you least expect it, you lose your mom and you never see her again. So yeah, I mean, that was a huge, huge thing to, um, to go through and, and learn from and overcome. Uh, losing my dad as well, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, when I was making the Dream Theater album, Black Clouds and Silver Linings, I, I wrote a song for him called The Best of Times uh, that I was able to share with him uh, before he passed away. And it was a song that I wrote for him, thanking him for our 40 years together at that point. And um, the fact that I was able to pl play that for him and hold his hand at his bedside when, you know, when he was dying and play him the song and cry together and share, you know, share that gift with each other before he passed. That was, that was also uh, incredibly um, important for me, you know? Yeah, I mean, I had both extremes with losing both of my parents. One was completely shocking out of nowhere, unexpected. And then the other was, you know, when you have months and months of somebody struggling with cancer and you actually have that time to prepare and be with them. And, you know, it's two different extremes and I, I don't know, you know, neither of them are easy. Uh, but I, I was able to go through both of those experiences with both of my parents. Man, I, I've done uh, maybe close to 650 interviews. It's only the second time I've gotten misty eyed. That was very eloquent, man. And oh, wow. uh, meaningful how you uh, talked about that with your dad. I'm real sorry for your losses, man. Well, thank you. Well, there's also an amazing story of my mom, which I. C can you share that? Because that, when yeah. I, I heard that and then I called Ray. Yeah. And I said, I'd really like to get Mike on. Yeah, that. I mean, I, 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 can, I can retell, I'll retell it again. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to exploit it, but uh, it's been told before. If, but I guess for those of you that never heard it, it was um, the night that my mom died in the plane crash. Uh, earlier that day, there was a teacher in, in class um, giving a lesson about carpe diem, um, seize the day, and it was, he was telling us all to appreciate life and appreciate our loved ones because you never know what might happen. And he said, when you get home tonight, give your mom or your dad a hug and a kiss and tell them how much you love them because you never know if, you know, what might happen. Sure enough, that night I go home and my mom's getting ready to go out and get on the, the, the plane for Atlantic City uh, with her and her, her boyfriend at the time. And I was ready to go out with my friends and I was about to run out of the house. And then I remembered this carpe diem lesson. I turned around, went back to my mom and great, gave her a big hug and a kiss and told her I loved her. And at first she was taken aback, like, wow, what is that? I, <laughs> where'd that come from? And I was like, I just want you to know that how much I love you. And, and that was the last time I saw her. I, that night, she, uh, she died in the plane crash. And um, if I hadn't been given that lesson that day, I probably would not have had that moment. So I always tell people this story just so, <laughs> you know, maybe it could change their life the way it yeah. changed mine. You know, me hearing that lesson changed my life forever and gave me a moment that I'll never, ever have again and I cherish. So uh, yeah, it was one of those moments that was like life changing. And I wrote uh, the song, uh, A Change of Seasons um, in Dream Theater. A lot of that, there's a whole section in the song uh, that's dedicated to this whole experience. So yeah, I, you know, losing both my mom and dad, I wrote about in Dream Theater songs. One was A Change of Seasons and one was The Best of Times. And uh, in both cases, I found that writing those lyrics were, uh, you know, very therapeutic. To, you know, help me grow through such emotional processes. Man, you're really good at communicating, communication and sharing your feelings. Um, I think the people on Blabbermouth might beg to differ. <laughs> accurately. I don't, Thank you. I, I don't read, I'm not a reader of Blabber. They, you know what, they, they, they had something on this, on this, on this show one time, because I have like, I got a flag or something like that. And it was right. Ray's episode of all people. He's like, I don't even know what it was just like Ray said, but it, right. now that I think about it, it was kind of like, it was like, it was nothing, it, right. but it was like all of a sudden I was like, well, that was weird. Um, well, here, I mean, not to, not to go back to it again, but here I am. I just <laughs> told you this, this two stories of losing my parents, probably the most heartfelt experiences I'll ever go through in my life. 
yet <laughs> this interview, I'm sure, will be reduced to some sort of uh, you know clickbait headline that's going to try to stir up controversy. In the biggest lesson way. Mike Portnoy learned. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this is, this is this is the world we live in. And anyway, you you're very good at communicating, especially emotionally. Were you always like that? Well, I think losing my mom at 17 made me grow up real fast. And it was even before that, um, going through divorces and things like that. My mm -hmm. mom and dad got divorced when I was a, a year and a half, and they each remarried, and then each went through second divorces. So you know, growing up with that kind of um Tra life. it's trauma man that's what yeah. it is for a you know, kid back in the 70s you know you didn't have the tools you have today you know you know right if so you had to grow up you had to grow up quick and uh, learn from these things and you know saddle up get on with life you know yeah but your ability to communicate that's a different skill set totally you know uh, well and, thank you yeah thank you do you know. you're, that was really good man well thank you props to you i appreciate that because i know that at least for me, that certainly stuff like that has not come easy. So I, uh, it's tough to do that. So I really thank you for sharing that. Um, is there any, if you had to go back and give advice to young Mike Portnoy, assuming you were listen, assuming you'd listen, is there anything that you would have told yourself that would have made your life easier? Don't eat the yellow snow. <laughs> I mean, there's always things you, you wish you'd done differently, <laughs> but realistically, I, you know, I have a tattoo right here on my arm. No regrets. No regrets. Uh, everything that happens, happens for a reason. And even if it's a, a setback, you learn from it and you grow from it. So what advice would I give myself? I don't know. I mean, I, I probably wish I had said less during the split with Dream Theater. Uh, yeah. You know, if I had said, I, I don't, re I don't regret what happened you know because it was supposed to happen and it needed to happen but maybe i regret saying as much as i did i think maybe my honesty uh is sometimes a dangerous thing you know it's the best yeah i mean i get that so so maybe sometimes it's better to say less uh you know so yeah i mean i, I don't know what advice i'd give though i think every you know all these stories we're telling here we're all learning experiences you yeah. know losing parents or all the struggles with the music industry or leaving dream theater these are all life experiences that you learn from and you grow from and it puts you on a, a certain path and you just gotta you gotta live that path the best you can it's funny uh my wife has many times said to me craig you cannot be so honest because if i because if someone tells me something, even if it hurts my feelings, quote unquote, which at 56, I'm not being, I'm, I mean, there's only so much that can hurt my feelings. I got my wife and kids, if they're okay, that's, you know, I'm good. But I, I like when someone, I'd rather you be brutally honest with me because then I know what's right. going, you know, don't piss on my back and tell me. Well, in real life, I'll, in real life, I'll always try to be brutally honest. And, but it's, it's when I'm doing interviews that I need yeah. to sometimes bite my tongue because not everybody knows the context of what you're talking about you yeah know? so uh it's like that jack nicholson quote from a few good men it's like you want the truth you can't, you can't handle, handle it <laughs> yeah uh do you remember the first record you ever bought i can't remember the first record i bought because i was surrounded by records from day one like i said i, I remember being surrounded by these little 45s with green apples on them when I was a baby, <laughs> you know, so I had all the Beatles records and I remember listening to Tommy when it came out. And I remember listening to early David Bowie albums when they came out and listening to the Rolling Stones, Satanic Majesty's Request. I remember all those albums when I was a kid, but which one did I actually buy? And I think, I guess, I think I remember saving up money to buy the four Kiss albums when they came out, the, the, the solo albums. Solo the Kiss records, solo yeah. Albums. 78. So I think that's the first time I could distinctly remember saving up money and then aunting, a, asking my aunt Sarah to drive me to the record store to buy the four Kiss solo albums. And I bought all four of them. Uh, it was, I guess, 1978. So I was about 11. And the funny thing is, I remember a few days later, uh, I took them to school with me and somebody stole, I, they were stolen. So I had to go back and buy them again. <laughs> But I, I, I hate to say it, but I only bought uh, Ace uh, 
Ace Pauls and and Jeans because I really wasn't a fan of Peter's. <laughs> so when I had to rebuy them, I only bought three out of four. Sorry, Peter. I love you and you're one of my heroes, but I just I didn't rebuy the solo album. <laughs> so you saved money the second time. Yeah, second time <laughs> I had to buy three instead of four. Hey, another tough question. Uh, top three Desert Island discs in no particular order, and just for this moment, because you know, twenty minutes from now it could be different. Well, I'm a I'm an OCD list maker. So All right. these lists so you got already this. exist. <laughs> you know, I already have my top 100 yeah. films, my top 100 albums, my top 10 albums. So what are they? I, I could give you my top five albums. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Rock and, rock and roll. And it's in chronological order because I can't possibly put them in favorite order. So chronologically, my top five classic albums are Sgt. Pepper, Beatles, mm -hmm. um, The Who's Tommy, uh, Ziggy Stardust by David Bowie, Elton John's Goodbye, Elbrook Road, and Pink Floyd, The Wall. So those are my top five chronologically. I uh, wouldn't necessarily be, I think The Wall would be higher if I wasn't doing it chronologically. And then I also have a modern five. So I'm going to just give you the, <laughs> my OCD. Hold on, your OCD is not allowing you to, you, you know, it's an open loop now unless you give me the modern ones, right? <laughs> exactly, I can't. So the oh modern, God. the top five modern ones would be uh, Jellyfish Spilt Milk, mm -hmm. um, Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique. Great record. The first Mr. Bungle album. Um, uh, Muse's Absolution and Radiohead's OK Computer. Great record. And that was, that was in no particular order. That was just, I know the five and there they are. So That's yeah, but so I'm an OCD funny. list maker. If you go to my websites or, or if you do a hashtag MP lists, You'll see all my favorite film directors, all my favorite movies, all my favorite albums. And, uh, you know, this it's the time of year right now where I'm coming up with all my year end lists. And to take it the next step, uh, I have all the decade ends lists coming out in the next week or so. So it's an exciting time to be a list maker. That's right, man. End of the year. Oh, my God. Uh, also, I don't know. Okay, I want to talk. Are you comfortable talking about getting sober? Sure. You sure? If you're not, it's totally cool. Yeah, we, let's, we, we can briefly touch on it. I don't okay. want to linger on it. Totally cool. Um, the, the reason I, I mentioned is because I've had so many people talk about getting sober on the show that we had, I've had literally dozens and dozens of listeners like thanking me for sharing yeah. those stories because if someone's having a, a, a hard yeah, time. I mean, yeah, that's what, that's what um, you know, when you're in, uh, when you're in AA and you're in the program, the 12 steps is about, the 12 step is about passing it on, passing on the message. And I wrote, a series of songs while I was in dream theater and, you know, through early sobriety, I wrote what's now been called the 12 step suite. Uh, when I first got sober in 2000, you know, the first next record I was making with dream theater was the six degrees of inner turbulence album. And uh, when, when I was in dream theater, I was always one of the um, main lyricists in the band uh, beside John Petrucci. So every album I would have two or three songs that I would always write lyrics to. And we were making the Six Degrees album. It's like, okay, what do I want to write about? And at that point, I was newly sober. And going through the 12 steps was the biggest thing in my life. So that's what I chose to write about. And I started writing um, the lyrics to the song, The Glass Prison. And um, I knew I wanted to write about the 12 steps. But the 12 steps was just, was just too huge to tackle in one song. So I had this idea of doing a few steps per album. And I would start this ongoing a uh, series of songs that, you know, would take many songs and many albums and many years to complete, but I would go step by step. So for that album, I wrote The Glass Prison, which was steps one, two, and three. Next album, I wrote This Dying Soul, which was uh, steps four and five. Next album was The Root of All Evil. I did steps six, seven, and eight. No, six and seven. Then came uh, Repentance, uh, which was eight and nine. And then finally, The Shadow Fortress, which was 10, 11, and 12. So it took five albums over the course of seven or eight or 10 years or whatever to complete the entire 12 step story. And um, it was very, very therapeutic to write about each step and focus on each one. Uh, it helped me with my step work. And, uh, and then like you just said, you know, through the years I've had so many countless people come to me and thank me for those lyrics because you know, they, if they were struggling with addiction, it doesn't even have to be alcoholism, you know, addiction oh, yeah. could go across the board to, everything from gambling to sex addiction, sex addiction to drugs. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so writing about those 12 steps and completing those songs meant 
a lot to me and, and apparently a lot of other people that it helped as well, and which is always really nice to hear. And then um, in, in 2017, for my 50th birthday, like I mentioned earlier, I, for the first time ever, played the five songs together, which was always the intention. Oh, man. I, I left Dream Theater right after completing that process, so I never had a chance to perform it with Dream Theater. So at my 50th birthday show, we did it for the very first time with a, a, a group of amazing musicians I put together, and then we ended up throughout the year doing a tour, um, you know, celebrating my 50th birthday and also, you know, giving the Dream Theater fans a chance to finally hear these songs played in its entirety. Uh, just for the sake of, uh, you know, completion and getting it all, out of all of our systems because it never had had a chance to happen. So we finally did that with the Shattered Fortress Tour and it was, it was a great experience. That's cool, man. And just so you know, the context under which I'm asking you is that, you know, in the service vein of putting, of paying yeah, yeah. it forward. So that's, there's no malintent in any... No, 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 of course, of course, I get it. Um, I guess the, the primary question, again, if you're comfortable, what was the what prompted you to get sober what was the you know well um i would say the biggest thing was it was it was back in 2000 and my daughter was three years old and my son was one year old he was you know he was just born and uh i always had a uh an addiction problem uh not only with alcohol and drugs but everything i mean look look at my look, <laughs> i can't do anything in moderation I, I i've always known i can't do anything in moderation everything was done in excess and that included drinking and drugging and my kids were kids they were just born and i knew my drinking was out of control i mean i was literally you know playing on stage drunk every night and you know drinking myself to sleep every night and uh i knew i was just it was very unhealthy uh, activities and I knew I was out of control and I no longer controlled it. It controlled me. And, um, you know, I, I would look at my heroes like John Bonham and Keith Moon that died in their thirties. And, you know, at that time I was 33 and I didn't want to end up uh, a rock and roll casualty like, like Bonham or Keith Moon. I wanted to live to raise my kids and be a responsible father and husband. And uh, I knew I needed to, I needed to clear up and get sober in order to be able to provide that and to be able to, you know, survive. So uh, at that point I, I surrendered. Um, I admitted I was an alcoholic years before that. I knew it, but I just figured what the hell, you know, I, I could handle it. But uh, at that point I wanted to be a better father and husband and raise my kids responsibly and, you know, in sober households. So uh, that was kind of the, the catalyst. Um, wasn't like I lost my job or I lost my wife or it hadn't, it, none of those things had happened yet, but I yeah. knew they were right around the corner if I didn't do something about it. Man, that, very cool of you. Um, just so you know, I, I've had family people involved, so I'm totally I'm down with the 12 step program. And I think it's a great thing. Um, one other question for people who are, afraid of asking for help because that is seems to be the toughest part what advice or well, you, thoughts you can't, you can't do it alone it's impossible it's abs uh if you're an alcoholic uh, you don't have willpower there's no such thing as willpower for an alcoholic or an addict so you need a higher power and that doesn't necessarily mean god it just means you need something other than yourself to help you and that's the first step the first st step is surrendering and admitting you have a problem and well the second step is the actual reaching out for help but it's imperative i i, I would not have been able to do it if i didn't surrender and go to uh you know the 12-step program and get a sponsor and have people help me uh i proven time and time and time again on a daily basis that i couldn't do it myself uh so i had to ask for help in order to actually get over that that step Man, I can't thank you enough for keeping everything so real. Honestly, man, thank you. You're a very sincere guy, man. I appreciate thank you, man. that. Um, most important things you've learned about yourself? Oh, God. Well, I mean, I guess you could tell from this conversation, you know, I'm just like a, <laughs> an OCD kind of obsessive compulsive guy. Um but I always knew that, you know, I guess I, you can need to kind of just uh, be comfortable in your own skin. I've never tried to be something I'm not. Uh, even in the early days of Dream Theater, like 
our roles were immediately defined by our personalities. You know, I knew, we knew immediately, you know, John Myung was the quiet guy. John Petrucci was the consummate, you know, musician guy. And I was always like the, the perfectionist, like running the show and directing things. And, and I was always the outspoken one that did the interviews. And so, you know, I learned, I had to look at myself all those years and we, you know, that kind of helped define all of our roles within the band. Um, and then in terms of my life, you know, uh, you know, we've talked about getting sober. We've talked about losing, losing people you love. Um, I've also been fortunate to have a, a great uh, marriage. I'm with my wife now for 30 years and my kids are now oh, dude, 20, and 20 and 22. So, right on, right? you know, uh, you have to look at yourself honestly and, and know who you are <laughs> in order to, you know, move on in life. But, you know, when I did get sober and I did the 12 steps with my sponsor, that was a huge part of looking at yourself and trying to better yourself and, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of, you have to make a lot of amends to people you may have heard or done wrong things to. And that process really helped me grow up a lot as well. Good, man. You have any non-musical superpowers, Mike? No. <laughs> I mean, uh, like I said before, I can't even, uh, change a light bulb. My, my, <laughs> my talents are only musical and then um, organizational. I was gonna say list making, you're a meme, yeah. you're a motherfucker. I mean, like <laughs> if, if I was to walk to this, my, my laptop, I have a movie theater with every <laughs> film uh, broken down by director and uh, alphabetical and chronological. So yeah, I mean, my organizational skills, and I guess I, I apply that to my music. Like I've always been the one in every one of my bands to write the live set lists or to sequence the album order. Um, that obsessive compulsive organizational aspect of me I'm, i've been able to utilize it on a creative level where i'm able to really um you know I, with, with dream theater i used to write different set lists for every single show i would literally obsess in the hotel rooms on the days off doing the research okay we're in detroit so i would look up the last three times we played detroit i'd get the set list oh, and wow. never repeat a set list ever so i would write a set list for every city that was completely different from the previous tours and then if we're playing like two nights in the same town i would write two dip completely different set lists without repeating a song between the two nights so that, wow. that's the way i used to construct the dream theater set lists once we had a giant catalog to work with so i guess that crazy ocd organizational uh curse <laughs> was able to be a, a blessing at least for the yeah. fan uh, you know in that respect Biggest business win and biggest personal win. Business win and personal win? Yeah. Oh, uh, um, I don't look at them as wins. I would say achievements, if anything. Okay. The word win, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't think music or life is a contest. You know, you win a contest. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. Know, yeah, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually modify my yeah. question because I feel the same way. Achievements. Actually. Then. Achievements. All right, so personal would be... Um, the Mike my Portnoy question now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my biggest personal achievements would be uh, being able to stay with my wife for thirty years and ra and then have two beautiful kids that are both incredibly talented and they're both really good kids. You know, so Melody and Max, uh, and my wife Marlene. You know, that's my 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 wife and kids are my biggest personal achievement. Biggest career achievement. Once again, it's not a contest. You know, music can't be measured, but I'll say probably the most. Um, flattering award I've ever gotten was when I was inducted in the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame. Uh, because uh, even up till now, there's no like hard rock or heavy metal drummers in there. And last year, Dave Grohl was inducted. So up until Dave Grohl, up until this past year, I was the only hard rock or heavy metal guy in there. And I was also the youngest by far. The Modern Drummer Hall of Fame was all the legends, you know, Buddy Rich, Gene Kruper, uh, Ringo Starr, uh, Neil Peart, Keith Moon, John Bonham, Ginger Baker, and then little old Mike Portnoy, you know, mixed in with all these guys. So to to have gotten in there and gotten in there so young, uh, I was inducted in 2004. So that's already 15 uh -huh. years ago. I was in my, uh, I guess I was... 30s, right? Yeah, in my 30s at that time. So that at that time was uh, unheard of and shocking to me. And up until Dave Grohl, I was I remained the youngest in there, and still to this day, there's no other hard rock guys other than me and Dave at this point. You know, there's no Tommy Lee or Lars Ulrich or 
or uh, Alex Van Halen, like nobody in my generation or even the generation before me in the hard rock world, Ian Pace, all those guys, they're still not in there. So it's crazy that I got in there and got in there so young. So to me, that was always one of the greatest drumming achievements. That's your blabbermouth quote you just said. <laughs> oh, <great. laughs> Mike Portnoy says, uh, bla- you know. I'm in there with Alex Van Halen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. We've identified it. Uh, two more questions, man. And really, you're a really sweet guy. Thank you very much oh, for man. your time, man. My pleasure, uh, man. Funniest thing that's happened to you on stage or in the studio? Oh, funniest. Well, funniest. I mean, everything that's happened in Spinal, everything in Spinal Tap has happened to me. Every one of them. <laughs> Falling off stages, not find, not being able to find the stages, all, you know, everything. Uh, I don't know what the funniest is. I mean, there's been multiple times where like the intro tape will be rolling and we're still in the dressing room and we can't even hear that it's rolling. And then we head to the stage and, you know, we're everybody's standing there in silence. <laughs> start like for five minutes already. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've had, uh, I wouldn't <laughs> say the funny. funniest, but the, the craziest thing that ever happened yeah. on stage was, uh, it was back in 1997, we were playing in Munich, Germany, and it was the last song of the set, and I guess I bit off more than I could chew with this fill. I just thought I was superhuman and would be able to play the fastest fill ever, and I just go around the toms as fast as I can, and all of a sudden, I feel a sharp pain. It felt like I pulled a muscle, and I look over, and my wrist it was snapped backwards. It was dislocated with my, the palm of my hand facing upwards. Oh, my I, God. I, yeah, I panicked. I turned blue. I was like, oh, my God, what the fuck? And I had to bang my hand back into position, stick it into a bowl of ice, and finish the show with one hand. But uh, I, had en- I had ended up dislocating my wrist and had to go straight to the hospital at the end of the show. So that was uh, the craziest thing that's ever happened to me on stage by far. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like dislocating your wrist across the world. Wow, yeah. man. Holy shit. That's creepy. And last question, as my lawnmowers are here, my landscape guy, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? Uh, well, um, biggest change in my personality in the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, we talked about how death changed me. Uh, we talked about how sobriety changed me, but uh, if you're pinpointing it to the last 10 years, the last 10 years has been my post dream theater career. You know, I left the band uh, coming up on 10 years. So I guess the, that would kind of define the, the era that I've been living and learning from in the last 10 years. And I guess the biggest thing I've had to learn is how to um, adapt to different situations. You know, with dream theater, it was 25 years in the same environment with the same people and my roles were very clearly defined. I was the de facto leader of the band overseeing 90% of the decisions, not necessarily the songwriting. We did that together, but everything beyond the songwriting was in my lap. So after leaving dream theater, I had to learn how to adapt to very different situations. And I've actually grown to love these different uh, situations. You know, I, I liked, carrying the load in dream theater and being the quote unquote leader. Uh, there's something to be said for that uh, amount of control and, uh, you know, being satisfied with the results and having that amount of control over the results. Um, but since then I've had to learn how to be a, a team player because in bands like, uh, the winery dogs or, uh, flying colors or metal allegiance, uh, you know, sons of Apollo in these bands, it's more of a collaborative process where I need to learn how to, you know, collaborate and, and we share the, 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 the responsibilities in the creative process and we delegate them. So I've become, I think, a much better team player and collaborator. And I've also had situations where I had to be just a hired gun, you know, playing with Twisted Sister or Avenged Sevenfold. In those cases, I was just there to do a job and play drums and shut up. And I'll tell you what, I actually really enjoyed that role. In fact, I would welcome more of it. I would love if, uh, if, if another opportunity like that came around where I could just be a hired gun and play drums because the, both of those tours with, uh, both of those experiences with Avenged and with Twisted Sister were some of the favorite tours I've ever been a part of. So yeah, I would absolutely welcome just being the hired gun type 
uh, for any kind of situation like that if it arose in the future. So I guess I've had to learn how to adapt to different environments and different situations. In some cases, I'm, I have to play the leader. In some cases, I have to be a team player and a collaborator. And in other places, other situations, I just am a hired gun and there to do a job. And I've had to learn how to find uh, each of those roles in every different situation I'm a part of. And you sound like you're in a good place right now, and I'm happy for you, man. I am, man. It's been a it's been a great a great life, a great career, and uh, you know the last ten years in particular, you know that we've been talking about here. It's it's been uh, it's been quite a ride and a, a dream come true, really. So I couldn't be happier. Let me tell. Let's let me just go over a couple of things what you got going on. <laughs> a couple. Uh, so Sons of Apollo is going out on tour January, North America, February in February and March in Europe, April, South America. Any other tours or stuff that you want to mention that's going on? Well, let's see. Let's go through each band. Sons of Apollo, we have the new album in January and then the tour. Um, uh, Neil Moore's band, we have a live album coming out in March, which will be from the tour that we just did this past year. Flying Colors, also uh, a live product coming out next year from the tour we did this year. Uh, Transatlantic has a, a new studio album that'll be coming out towards the end of 2020 uh, that we're working on now. Uh, the Winery Dogs are still on a bit of a break, but we're hoping we'll be doing a new album uh, starting next year. So uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, that will happen. Uh, Metal Allegiance, I'm playing with uh, at, at NAM as we do every year. That's this January. And there's kind of a Metal Allegiance kind of offshoot covers album that's coming out next year as well. It's not as Metal Allegiance, but it's me and a bunch of the Metal Allegiance guys. Um, Phil Demmel, uh, who used to be a Machine Head, and Bobby Blitz from Overkill, and Mark Mengi, the bass player of Metal Allegiance. We got together to do a fun covers album. It's not really a new band or new side project. It's just a fun covers album that's coming out next year. So that's kind of coming from the Metal Allegiance family. Uh, and what else? Did I cover all the bands there? I think so. Um, yeah, that's Neil about Morse it. Group? That's Anything with that? Neil Morse group? Yeah, Neil Morse band. We have the live thing coming out. And then I think next year we'll start looking at a new album. Thing is, when you have all these bands, you have to uh, not only look at what you're doing day to day, but you also have to think ahead six to nine months because you got to start planting the seeds for where you're going to go. You know, I just finished doing flying colors. Now I had to like get into sons of Apollo mode. And after that, I got to get into transatlantic mode. So you kind of like have to look at these like six months, nine months in advance in order to plant the seeds and prepare the next cycle for, you know, whatever you're doing eventually when that ends. So it's kind of a never ending hopscotch game for me. And if someone wants to, Hire you as a side man. What's the best way to connect you? Social media? I, don't, I mean, I don't really do side man stuff. I'll, I'll occasionally do a, a session work for somebody if, if, I, if I like what they do and I respect what they do and if I have the time. But between the six bands that, that I'm a part of now, I don't have much available time. You know, if somebody hits me up or if it's somebody I respect, I'll, I'll do their album or I'll do a track or two. But it's not like I'm a, you know, not really available for hire. Okay. Really. I just don't have the time. No, I hear you. I know six bands kind of keeps you full, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's man, nice. listen, thank you very much, man. You're a really sweet guy. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you keeping it real and being so straightforward, man. That means a lot. Oh, thank my you pleasure, very man. Much, man. That's the only way I know, but thank you. I really appreciate well, I appreciate that. That's a gift. So thank you. Hang on one second. Let me wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Mike Portnoy for spending time with us. Also, check out Mike on tour with Sons of Apollo coming up soon and his all of his other projects he's got going on here. And uh, most important, don't forget that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar or your drums and uh, have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Thank you, brother. <laughs>